Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. I'm Mark, and today we're going to add another cutting board video to the nearly infinite pile of cutting board videos that are out there on YouTube. So, why make another cutting board video? Mostly because it's the Christmas time of year and I'm in the process of making some because some people wanted them as gifts to give away. But also because I think the story of this particular style of cutting board is a little bit interesting. After all of the different boards I have made over the years, end grain, edge grain, all of the different fancy ones, and all of the ones that we've kept here in the house, nine times out of 10, what board do we grab? This ratty old thing. This is actually a board that my wife and I got for our wedding, it was in the pile of wedding presents. I don't even know who got it for us. Originally, I believe this was a Chicago cutlery board. It said it somewhere on here. And over the years, we always go to grab this one first, mostly because it's the right size. If you're just gonna cut an onion, if you're just gonna cut an apple, if you're gonna cut something small, you don't need a bigger one. You don't really need a fancier one. You just need a cutting board to cut something on quick. And this is the one that we always grab. That's going on some number of years ago, 15-ish. And this has been re-sanded once or twice. I've actually cut it and re-glued it back together because it's taken so much damage and yet we still always go for this board. The thing about this board that I didn't know is that when I go to cut on it, I almost always cut on this side. So I go and cut an onion and I'm cutting it on the juice groove side. This just feels like the top to me. Then I go to cut an apple and I go to cut it on this side. And then my wife takes a bite of the apple and says, why does this apple taste like onion? No, I didn't cut them back to back. It's just she thinks this side has that flavor in it now. So she went to the habit of stinky stuff, onions, garlic, whatever that makes a smell you cut off the top, the juice groove side, and fresher fruits, different things that don't have that much of a smell or a strong flavor that can share to other things, you cut off the other side. Well, I knew this was the habit, but I didn't know which was which. So I started doing like meat on one side and plants on the other side. And now I've contaminated both sides of her cutting board with onions and garlic and whatnot. So in order to fix that, I started making this exact cutting board, but then I would laser what you're supposed to cut on that side on it. So I've got fish and garlic and chicken, just generally aromatic stuff goes on the juice groove side and fruits and vegetables that don't make a lot of stink go on the other side. So now, even an idiot like me can know this is for one type of food and this is for another type of food. This has actually been a little bit popular. I've made quite a few of these over the last few years since I came up with the idea of labeling what to do on each side. And that is what I'm batching out today. So let's go check out the whole process. There's nothing too remarkable about it. If you've already seen cutting board videos, you're probably not going to be impressed. It's just the reasoning behind it that I think is what makes this a valuable video. So anyway, time to get into the build. To get started with this, I have already gone through some of my stash of wood here and found mostly not free, mostly imperfection free full length boards that I cut down and now we have to joint it and plane it and get it all squared up and ready to go. I got all the material milled up, flattened out, got the edges right so that they glue together nice, and then I've got everything split up into roughly a blank for an individual board. So now I've got to start gluing everything together, and I'm going to try to do that by doing whatever fits on here. Maybe three boards. I think these are 32 inch clamps. Yeah, I think I can do three boards per set of clamps. Now, you might ask, why didn't you leave the boards eight feet long so that you could just glue eight foot long boards together and then cut them to length? That is easier overall, except that all these boards had little imperfections here and there. And to use as much of the material as I could, uh, I had to cut it up first and specifically cut out the little bits of imperfections. That's why I 
ended up with some little ones. This right here, you can tell it was going to be a great big nasty knot and I was able to cut it where it was still going to be usable. So now what I'm going to do is glue that edge, glue that edge, not glue this, glue that edge, glue that edge, glue that edge, not glue this, glue that edge, glue that edge. So everything that's up is going to get glue on it, then I'll pull them together and then I'll tighten the clamps down and we'll be moving on. Alright guys, so at this point all of these blanks are ready to get cut out using my Onefinity. Uh, to get it set up in here, I was over in VCarve Pro and I got the file set up to do a juice groove and then a separate path. We've got small board groove and we've got small board outline. Two different tool paths you can see over here. We've got like I'm using the Jenny bit. Total depth is 0.7, even though these boards are 0.75, I will leave that much material on the bottom to keep it from moving around on me. I exported this stuff, I plugged it into the Masso controller, and I ran a test on just a piece of MDF cut to the exact same size as those blanks. There's gonna be maybe 3 eighths of an inch of extra material on either side and about an inch of extra material on either end. But we have two paths going here, so it cuts it to really the depth that I want on the first pass. Then it goes down just 0 0.005, I think, to clean it up just a little bit so hopefully there's not so much sanding in the bottom of that juice groove. I'm gonna go through the entire stack to do this first. Then I'm going to go back through the entire stack with the cutout bit, with the Jenny bit, to cut out the actual size of the whole thing. That way I'm not swapping bits back and forth for every single one of them I'm, I'm batch processing here. The other thing that I'm doing is when I shove this up there, I'm gonna mark the registration corner so I know that it always goes back up in there because if by accident I got a piece turned around and I went like this even though I did my best to be completely centered it might not be centered which means you'd have gaps different on either side so with that registration mark that'll get me started back in the same place so we're gonna register off of that corner shove it up put one fence in place the other fence in place all of the forces from the spindle are going down. There's nothing pulling it up, so I don't really need clamps down on it. This is just keeping it from sliding around. Now all I have to do is go program, rewind, just to make sure we're back at the beginning, and hit cycle start, and then it'll kick on the vacuum, the spindle, and then send the project running. It's actually a really nice finish already, but now it's going to step down just that tiny little bit and hopefully make it that much cleaner. No sanding. We're going for no sanding on this. There. Just like that, one of the grooves is done. Swap out. Swap in. Put my registration mark on it. I'm going to do that on all of them so I don't have to keep remembering that step and then just lock it back in and start and I'm going to do that through this entire pile. At this point, we have gotten through all of the juice grooves, so I no longer need the bowl bit in there. My X and Y 
are not going to change at all, but my Z will. So I just need to take out my bowl bit, put in my Jenny, then we'll reload a piece of material and re-zero the Z height. There. Doesn't need to be crazy tight, just needs to be a little tight. So we've got the MDF back in place. This is my test board. The registration mark is back into the corner. And then we're just going to probe for Z again. I could do it by eyeball if I wanted to. I don't really want to. Touch that to the collet. Touch that. Turns green, so we're solid. Probing. Probe. Here we go. So now we have reset Z height. We can hook the dust back up and we can cut the MDF out and make sure everything is exactly the way we want it before we switch to nicer woods. Our finishing pass actually looked really, really clean. So it's just a little bit of material left. I didn't cut all the way through. That makes it really easy to keep things in place. I don't have to mess with tabs. So you can see I left about that much material all the way around. Not much at all, just enough to really hold it in place. And this is thin enough that it will all disappear with the round over that I'll give it in the, I don't know, next to last step here. All right, these are all finished up now. They've been sanded, they've been cleaned. I blew the dust off with the air compressor and now it's ready to go into my mineral oil bath. Uh, looks like we're getting a little bit light on this, but it tends to work pretty well. So I just drop them in as many as I can fit into this big tub and I'm gonna let them soak for about an hour. I did a whole video on how long do you really need to soak a cutting board? I'll link to that. Uh, I found that like an hour, it's gonna drink up as much as it possibly, as much as it needs to, as much as it wants to. And you just kinda help let it be a little bit submerged. I can probably even throw one more in there and, and not be in too bad a shape. But after that, we will throw my little drying rack up here. And these, because of their rounded edges, aren't gonna sit up very well like they used to like this is designed for, but these will sit here like that and drip off. And then I have tiny little kerfs cut in the ends of these things. So if any of that oil tries to flow to the end, it actually drips back into the bucket before it can spill out onto the table around you. So that's kind of a nice little feature about this. These will soak like that. Then I will wipe them off and they'll be all done, ready to go, ready to sell. One thing I wanna mention is that it seems like a trend lately is to be pretty negative about using mineral oil. And that's fine. If you're not into it, you're not into it, but there's nothing wrong with it. It's been used for wooden cutting boards forever. It's incredibly simple, it's safe, and it's really, really easy to rejuvenate a board by just dumping some more on it after the fact if your board starts to get dry. So I still like mineral oil. Um, that's about it. I can't think of a whole lot else to talk about. I'm going to let these soak, and then I'm gonna just keep cycling them through here and wiping them dry on this towel. I'm guessing if you've watched this video to this point, you are perfectly capable of making these yourself. But if you'd like one, if you'd like to buy one that I made, uh, they're gonna be on my website and I think I'll get them listed on Etsy too. So you can go check links down below. Also different tools, you know, my Onefinity using VCarve Pro, which I'm still new to that software, but I'm really, really liking it. It helped clean up these edges. There was almost no edge sanding to be done with these once it came off of that machine. 
So once I did that finish pass, that full depth finish pass, real nice, real nice. Um, that's enough rambling, that's enough thinking, that's enough saying. Um, thank you very much for watching. Check out all the links and come back next time. See you guys.